thank you so much for being here. During this presentation, Corey and I are going to explain our projects in which basically we have tried to create what we call an astronaut on a chip. As many of you may already know, one of NASA's current goals is to start doing long-duration space missions. And when I say long-duration, I mean going to the moon and beyond. The thing is that right now we understand how space conditions such as microgravity or cosmic rays affect human body. But what will happen if we subject our bodies to these conditions for a longer period of time? Or how can we prepare the health of the astronauts who are going to be involved in this kind of missions? These are some of the questions that our project tried to respond, since, since knowing the answer is something crucial to ensure succeed, not only for the mission, but also for the crew on board. So the main idea in which we have been working is just to create a chip that can automatically cultivate cells that represent human organs. So by sending this chip for a specific period of time to the International Space Station or the getaway, we will be able to observe what kind of tissue and cellular damage could this astronaut experience. Our final goal is to recreate a whole astronaut that will be a chip that represents all major human organs connected between them. The thing is that this is a quite innovative approach, so we are just currently now focused on three different organs, which are the brain, the liver, and the gut. And to be able to understand how these chips work, it's very important to be familiar with the concept of organ on a chip. An organ on a chip, basically, it's a new technology based on a microfluidic device that mimics both the structure and the function of a specific organs through automated cell culture on a micro scale. We are talking about millimeters, so if we compare the size of these chips to the size of a normal human body, the difference is insane. And one of the most important components of these devices is what we call microfluidic channels, because they contain fluids such as nutrients, bloods, and even the cells that we are trying to cultivate. So just to get a general idea of the size of these chips, here we have an image of a real organ on a chip, whereas you can see it's pretty small. And another interesting thing about these devices is that they can recreate three-dimensional cell cultures. Traditionally, cells used to grow on two-dimensional cell culture, which means that they grow on a flat surface. And this creates a shape that it's not quite representative of their in vivo morphology. So when the three-dimensional cell cultures were introduced, we started seeing a more natural shape. So that's the reason why in our chips, we are going to use what we call organoids. An organoid, basically, it's a micro three-dimensional structure made of a high amount of cells that represent human organs or specific tissues. And here we have some image just to know how they look. And this is the appearance of a brain organoid. Then we have the gut organoid with these little imaginations that represent a real microvilli on a real gut. And this is how a liver organoid looks like after growing for 50 days. So at this point of the presentation, we have seen the most important concepts of our research. And now we are going to start going through the different uh, systems that we have been studying during the summer. So as my partner Marta said before, the main goal of this project is to try to take a astronaut's cells and put on a microscopic chip that mimics the human body. We want to be able to send this chip into space right before the astronaut. So when it goes into space in a harsh environment, we'll be able to see how the cells react. And in turn, we can picture how the astronaut themselves will react in the environment. This will allow us to try to make sure that the astronaut can be in tip-top condition before and after the launch of space. So how does it start? Think of it like a newborn there. Uh, going with the embryonic body cells here, they're going to start off as just day zero, right? A blank slate here, a droplet. But in a few days, you're going to start to show some change. Like, think of it like this here. As you see below there, after five days, after 10 days, see that gray outline? That's the ectoderm, the germ layer. Think of the ectoderm as your skin, right? Your skin protects you from all these germs, bacteria, protecting your inner parts, right? The derm is just like that, but for the cells. So while the cells are undergoing their maturation and getting older and older, the ectoderm is going to protect them from germs, bacteria, and viruses. But wait, as these cells get older, they're going to start to crave something. They're going to start to crave food, nutrients, in order to sustain themselves, keep them living. So in order to combat against that, we're going to insert them with matrigel, a few droplets here. The matrigel is going to make them expand, get bigger, and keep them alive here. And as you can see below, that they start to take a more unique shape from the circular ones. And I'm going to ask the audience a question before moving on. And imagine this, right? As I said, the matrigel promotes growth, but is that a good thing? 
near the very end of it, you get to see how the cells are now developing, almost there to forming a full-on tissue cell. When this happens there, we'll put in an orbital shaker, uh, an incubator that's going to promote the growth there. I'm going to go in more detail later, but just remember how this incubator, this orbital shaker is going to promote the cell growth inside. So the blood-brain barrier, uh, what is it? Uh, where is it located? It's located in the capillaries of the brain. But that still doesn't answer the question, of what is it? Think of like a door. Uh, you're going to a club, uh, VIP access, right? Those are on the list get let in. Those who are not on the list get kicked out. Uh, those who are on the list are things like cells and blood vessels. Those who aren't on the list are pathogens, so toxins, viruses, bacteria, things like that. But how does it relate to our research, you're probably asking. Well, think of it like a really bad case of sunburn, right? You're going to the beach with friends and family, you're relaxing, and you remember, oh no, I didn't put on sunscreen. Well, think of it like that, but on a much more severe level for the astronauts. They're closer to the sun than we are. So they don't have the luxury of the ozone layer, the magnetosphere of the Earth. So when they go into space, they're feeling the full effects of the sun. Uh, so things like severe sunburn there, uh, things like nausea, dizziness, uh, their immune system becomes compromised. Their organs, such as the brain, liver, and gut become all damaged. So how does this affect the barrier? Well, think of it like this, the sun's rays are so strong they can penetrate the astronaut's suit and affect the brain directly there, forcibly breaking through that door and going into innermost section of the brain and damaging it with the radiation. And how can we combat against this? Uh, the microglia, what is it? The microglia are the immune cells that are in the body, one of the oldest. They're mainly used to study diseases like Alzheimer's or autism, but in this case here, they're used to help the blood-brain barrier. Not only do they enhance it, but they also repair it, but not in a way that you think. How do they protect enhance it? Well, think of it like this. Uh, bacteria can get through the doorway, right? They break through the door of the blood-brain barrier and start to go into the brain. Uh, the microglia, they start to be dispatched there. Think of like soldiers fighting an unknown enemy. They will go in there and try to attack this enemy head on, making sure that you're still safe and sound. Now then, as I said before with the soldiers here, like sometimes the soldiers are going to be wounded in the battlefield and be taken out. And this happens the exact same way, but for the microglia, they're going to become damaged during this fight there. So they're going to be taken out of play. And those who are on standby, the soldiers, are now going to swap from inflammatory to now attacking anti-inflammatory and take on the fight. And while this is happening, the blueprint barrier is now going to repopulate, create more cells. So in a way, repairing. Thank you so much, Corey. Now let's move on to the gut system, that it's the one in which we have been working the most because it presents really complex challenges. In first place, we are talking about an extremely active tissue with a high cell turnover. So the same happens to the organoid. They start going overdeveloped, and then as a result, we get a high amount of cell going necrotic. And the second challenge in which I think that Corey and I can agree that has been the most difficult one, it's the timing. The problem that we have with the gut organoids is that they usually last between 15 and 30 days. And in this case, we are trying to create a six month culture. So to face these challenges, Corey and I have been working during the summer in different designs with different versions. And now we are going to show you the final results that we have achieved. In my case, this is a design that I created. Here you can see like a real big image, but if we print it in real life, we will see that it would just take like a couple of centimeters, not more. So it's a really small design. In the design, we can identify three different sections. In the first one, which is the maturing section, we can see the channel where the organoids are growing connected to a um, blood vessel channel through a transport membrane. So, um, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> What here appears this, sorry for that. So uh, the objective of this setup is to um, not only feed the organoids, but also to remove the dead cells. In the middle of the cycle, we can see the media outlet, which is something essential because with it, we can access to the old media and clean the environment where the organoids are growing. And at the end of the of this, of this cycle, we can see what I call a size selection valve which basically here what we do is selecting the largest organoid to move on to the next section. And the organoids that are not big enough, they will go again through the whole cycle. 
So at this point of the design, let me remind that we are trying to create a six month culture. So the idea in which we have been working to, to this possible is in reusing the cells from the largest organoids. And for that, I created the what I call the dissociation section. In first place, we can find the collection tool that is basically here what we can do is pipette and access to the largest organoids. And after this tool, we can see this kind of zigzag pattern. And the thing with this complex geometry is that it helps to break up the organoids. So we are talking about a macrofluidic channel that starts with a size of 0.6 millimeter and ends up with 0.05 millimeters, which is pretty small. And at the end of the pattern, we can see the bit beater, which basically it's a device that can separate the remaining cells in terms of seconds. And finally, we get to the combination model where we can see this mix involved that has two inputs. One of them are the cells that comes from the bit beater, and the other input is the media that we need for just uh, keep alive the organoids and make them grow. So that's why I have placed here a media reservoir. So the objective of the mix involved is to combine both fluids in balanced proportions. So this way we can insert them again through the um, uh, maturation cycle through the incorporation both. So this way we can start the whole process again for the period of time that we want. So my design, my design takes a much more simplistic approach to this problem. Well, so as you see on the right there, the eye floats a microfluidic controller. It can connect to multiple pressure valves here and isolation valve, trying to make the system autonomous. For my system here, it's putting the multiple channels here, the maturation, size shaver, and matcher gel. For the maturation, once you insert the cells and then activate the pressure valve for the first one here, it'll go in a clockwise motion here. The clockwise motion is to get the matcher gel, the nutrients, and as it goes into the whole orbital shaker, promote a spherical design here so it doesn't impact it when going around and around and around getting its sharp edges here after that it will go into a second phase the second pressure valve and open up the isolation valve there autonomously after the few days have gone by once it happens there it goes through the size shaver now remember that question i asked the audience oh uh, why is the whole matrix growth important there uh so what if a cell gets too much right it gets too big it's going to want more and more food to sustain itself keep itself alive that it might not be able to get so in the result some cells might be dying dead by the time it gets by this process so in order to combat against this I thought of a size shaver channel, a disruptor. So when it goes through each iteration here, it'll get smaller and smaller through the tubing, effectively shaving off some of the size of the cells. So when they go through it, they'll be able to be at a size that's deemable where they can still get matter gel and still continue living without overgrowing. Once it goes through that disruptor, that size shaver channel, the third pressure ball will activate and then send it all the way to the matter gel chamber where they'll get nutrients again to make sure they'll be still alive and healthy before putting them back into the maturation channel where they'll continue this process for about six months. So what's next? Well, me and Marta are going to try to take the best parts of our design, the best of both worlds, and try putting in a one actual single design for the gut organoid system. After that, we're going to apply some calculations, uh, computational fluid dynamics, where we're going to run some simulations and tests to see if how the fluid is going to react to this say, the section here. Is it going to be at this speed? Is it going to be at that speed? Uh, how the cells react in this simulation here? Are they going to take this long to mature? We want to have these answers via the simulation. But afterward, we want to make sure our simulations match up with the results here. So we want to perform some in-lab experiments, see, hey, if these cells can last the six months here. Can they last longer? Will they last, like, not that long here? Would they be the size of a bigger one? Will be smaller size? We want to have this experiment answer the questions here. And lastly, we want to be able to connect our gut organoid system with the brain and liver systems here to create a fully autonomous uh, organoid system there. We can be able to take the cells of an astronaut and plug it into the system where they will now go and try to develop via each part of the body here, the brain, liver, and gut, effectively making an astronaut on a chip. Think of your attention. Oh, fantastic job. Um, gallery, make sure I can see everyone. So I think we have time for maybe maybe one question or two. If we have someone, I see a hand up, Sanjoy. No other questions? If not, Marta Curry, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I find it fascinating that you simulate an astronaut on a chip. <laughs> but my question is, how well are organoids 
true analogs of actual organs. I think of the brain as very, being very complicated, the gut being very complicated. How well do like a handful of cells really provide a good analogy for the experience of an organ in space? Well, for the brain, we are having like uh, really big problems in relation with the blood brain barrier because it's something really complex to represent. And for the gut, it's something that's never have done before, just like such a long cultural thing. So we need to do more lab experiments to know the answer to that question. Yeah, the main difficulty with the gut was how we try to make sure the cells have to sustain themselves via the six months here because it had to be autonomously because we can't be able to be there when they're in space with them there as they're going through the whole maturation cycle here, we have to make sure that they'll be able to get the right dose of gel without the need of us being actually up there. Very cool. And then we have a question from Clayton. I think we have time for. Yes. Hello. Uh, great presentation. So my question is, how would you use the media outlet in the International Space Station? Um. That's a really good question because actually I talked with Cassandra about the same thing just a couple of days ago. And basically the idea that we have for the media outlet is to turn off the pressure that goes around all the valving system. And then uh, we wait for the organoids to settle down. So this way we can access to the um, media outlet and then remove the old media to you know clean the space where the organoids are growing. The thing is that this uh, system works because we are on earth and we have gravity. So when we are in the International Space Station, this is not the case. So um, in this case, we have to think about a different kind of culture that I think that it's pronounced centrifugal uh, culture system. Well, it's a specific uh, culture system where you can create like partial gravity, but I don't really know how they work because this is something new for me. So I need to do a little bit more research of this, but yeah, basically that, that would be the main solution. Okay.